Uh, it's, hap- uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Goulden, uh, CFO of Booking Holdings. David, thanks so much for being part of the conference. My this pleasure. Year. Look forward to it, Eric. Thanks. Okay. So I think just starting at, at, with the current environment, I know we're going to get into a lot of big picture questions as well, but you guys talked very specifically in the last earnings call about what you're seeing from a demand environment standpoint. It's obviously been a very strong travel summer season that we just uh, wrapped up in the last week or so as everyone's coming off their summer vacations and and starting in with this conference this week. But just revisit some of the comments you made on the last earnings call just to level set what you guys are actually seeing from the demand environment for travel overall. Yeah, thanks, Eric. As as you say, we're seeing a strong environment. Um, What we said is that um, in July we saw year-over-year growth in demand of uh, 20% on, on room nights. That was up from 9% in uh, Q2. Um, but perhaps the easiest way to compare is with 2019, because obviously you get COVID compares when you go back to last year. So we said that uh, in Q2, we saw uh, room nights up 26% versus 2019, so well ahead of the marketplace. And that stays strong at about the same rate into uh, July. So uh, we're seeing a strong environment out there right now. Got it. Okay. Understood. One of the biggest topics or debates out there among investors on travel is just how to think longer term, less shorter term about ADRs. You know, obviously there's been a lot of inflation in the broader travel industry in the last couple of years due to that pent up demand. How are you guys as a company aligning, thinking about nights and ADRs and the elements or components of growth over the long term? Yeah, I mean, obviously those go hand in hand, right? Because the two combined kind of give us the the TTV uh, growth algo. Um, So I think a couple of things about the ADRs. First of all, they're very strong compared to 2019. If you go back to uh, last quarter, they're up over 30% compared to 2019. But that is four years of compounding, right? People sometimes realize that you know, we're comparing with a period that's four, four, four years ago. And there's also been a fair amount of um, inflationary pressure in particularly our hotel and alternative accommodation base. I mean, they've seen, um, they've seen utility bills go up. They've seen labor costs rise, et cetera. Um, so that's been, a, when you speak to them, that's been a big driver of the ADR um, increases. Also, what you've seen is that uh, we haven't seen consumers change their buying behavior because of that. They're not trading down. Uh, they're not doing short length of stay. So the market has basically absorbed it quite well. Um, hard to understand exactly where it's going to go. But as I mentioned, the property owners have seen underlying uh, expense I- increases that's been driving these changes. And when going forward, um, you know, we talked about this quarter, for example, Q3. We expect ADRs to be flat on a year on year basis, so we're not seeing them go up as much as they did, but they're certainly holding. And if you look at the inflation environment, it hasn't gone away, right? So yeah. when we look into 2024, people's underlying cost base is still going to be a little bit higher than it was in 2023. So uh, difficult to be certain, but there are some factors that seem to support the increases we've been seeing. Understood. And there was other interesting things coming out of this last earnings call with respect to geographies. You're obviously seeing a lot of growth and still a rebound environment in Asia. Can you discern out some of what you're seeing as you go around the world? And you obviously have the most global footprint of any of the names we look at in travel. So just curious what you might be seeing uh, across different geographies. Yeah, so if you have a um, look at Q2, we talked about we were um, up 26 points of room night growth versus 2019. And actually, interestingly enough, all our regions had recovered to roughly the same level. Um, and obviously that's been a gradual situation with the U.S. recovering first, then Europe, then Asia coming back. But Asia has come back quickly. Um, you know, we may get onto market share and we'll come back to later, but obviously that's higher than the market's grown. So when you kind of look at what we've got for the rest of the year, um, it implies basically low double-digit room night growth rate for, for the second half of 2023 on a year-on-year basis. We didn't give any specific uh, geocolor about that future outlook, but we can imagine that based upon what we've seen about Asia, Asia will continue to kind of lead the way. Um, in the back half of the year relative to overall growth. Got it. And, and maybe just one follow-up there with respect to Asia. Anything to call out with either cross-border of Asia into rest of world versus intra-Asia travel as different components of growth there? Yeah, so um, on a global basis, we said that in Q2, for the first time, our overall international mix, right, compared yeah. to the local mix, it actually got back to where it was in 2019, which is over a half, half of the room night bookings. Um, Asia international is still lagging. Yeah. So Asia recovery, like other markets, has been the local domestic market first, and it's lagging, and not surprisingly, the kind of long-haul 
lags the short haul and then it tends to recover in, in phases. So there's still opportunity there for further growth in Asia. Understood. Contrasted with pretty much every American friend I know who went to Europe this summer. Yeah, absolutely. Europe. <laughs> Europe's, Europe's a busy place right now. <laughs> exactly. Um, you, you talked about the concept of market share by GEOs. And away from some of the short-term dynamics, but just zooming out, you know, you guys have gained share in North America in the last couple of years. But more importantly, how do you think about the market share dynamic globally and what you're trying to solve for in terms of the offline to online switch, uh, elements of market share vis-a-vis -vis competitors, and how should we think about market share dynamics globally? Yeah, market share is an interesting topic because, as you know, market data in the travel space is tough to, yeah. to come by. So we can triangulate across uh, different sources. I think the first thing I'd say is go back to one of my prior comments. When you think of the second quarter, we're up 26-ish points of growth in room nights in every geography around the world. So they're all about the same. That's way ahead of market recovery. Um, so it's fair to say that we've gained share in every one of our major geos coming out of the pandemic. So um, that's good. Obviously, a lot of focus has been on the U.S., um, where we've made a ton of progress, and in July, we were over 30% up versus 2019. Um, I don't think there's any one particular driver. Um, there's multiple things that we've been doing to kind of drive that. Um, we've improved our products. They're very different from where they were in 2019. Our apps are much stronger. And we've lent into marketing and merchandising, the merchandising uh, muscle we've really built over the last few years on the back of our payments platform. Uh, we continue to build our relationships with our suppliers, both in the hotel, alternative, and, uh, and other verticals. It's kind of blocking tackling, but it's all led to, I think, a significant increase compared to where we were just, just a few years ago. Okay. And then last one on sort of the, the, the demand side or the, the unit economics of the business right now, thinking through take rate. You know, how, how do you guys think about stimulating demand via take rate, trying to grow supply via take rate, elements of take rate as a measure of driving strength in the business and, and what some of the variables or puts and takes for take rate are that we should be keeping in mind in the years ahead? Yeah, so th obviously there's many puts and takes, yeah. Eric, you say going to take rate. I think the first thing to start off is that our underlying take rate on our accommodations business, which is kind of a core central business, has, has, has not changed. And it's basically where it was in 2019. Now then on top of that, there are other variables come into place. Um, if we merchandise, that impacts take rates. Yeah. Uh, but we're still getting, that's basically us contributing into the pricing uh, e equation. Um, if we add new revenue streams like payments, those add to take rates, right? Because they get revenue uh, without having corresponding booking. Um, our take rates, we think there's, whilst there's puts and takes, we don't think that there's a lot of change moving forward from where we are right now. Um, there are some of the positives that, that I've talked about. There are some of the negatives in terms of things like flight mix, as that grows, that impacts yeah. take rates. Yeah. Uh, we did talk about the fact that this year we would gain, uh, regain some of the uh, take rate impact we lost last year uh, with timing yeah. would be a positive. And because the business has grown faster than we thought we were going to, and the booking window has extended, that benefit might also extend a little bit into 2024. That's a bit more tactical. But longer term, there's not the puts and pace on take rates are pretty much even out. Um, not a massive change from where we are right now. Okay. Um, maybe switching to more sort of the longer term initiatives and how the, the product set within the platform continues to evolve and turning to alternative accommodations. You know, yep. you and Glenn have both made comments about how that business continues to grow and scale and, and grow in inventory over the last couple of years. Level set for us the, what you're willing to share in terms of the state of your alternative accommodations today and how its uh, element of mix shift has changed for you in the last couple of years. Sure. So alternative accommodation is a very, very big business for us. And in total, you think in the last quarter, 34% of our room nights were in that sector. That's a very, very big business. And that's basically 200 basis points higher than it was in Q2 of last year. So it continues to grow a little faster than the average in the business. We expect that to continue going forward. Um, we have been driving that in a couple of different areas. Obviously, having supply is important. Yeah. And now we're up to a global listing of about 7 million at the end of the second quarter. Um, that's um, about 8% higher than it was a year ago, so we've been adding to that uh, inventory. We've also been adding sequentially, so you can look at the sequential increases from Q1 to, to Q2. They're also quite decent. Uh, biggest increase was in Europe, because that's our biggest business, but the U.S. was the second biggest piece from a sequential increase. I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, I'd say where we focus the most, we obviously focus upon that business globally, because it is a big global business for us, but where we know we still have some... Um, 
development to do is in the uh, US marketplace, where we've essentially only been in the alternative segment for a few years, whereas in other parts of the business, we've been in there for much, for much longer. And we believe that we're gaining traction. We're actually working very closely with our supply partners to ask them what they need from us to help us uh, be more competitive in that uh, marketplace. And if you think of the enhancements that we've done to the product uh, recently, I'll give you four. They've all really been driven by requests from our supply partners to kind of help us help them in, in the space. So I'll give you four that we've rolled out recently. One is an enhancement to our payment system for the alternative partners. So it's easier for them to manage multiple properties on the one platform and reconcile and get the payments more, more, more frequently. Uh, second is a partner liability insurance. We didn't have that before. We do now. That's important to many of our partners. Uh, we completely simplified the damage uh, policy where we used to go out to the, to the customer and ask them for the, the, damage, the damage payment. Uh, but now we don't. We, go, we basically self-insure that and go after, go after the customers if there's a problem, simplifying that whole process. And last but not least, we were fundamentally against this, but we had enough pressure from our partners to say, look, certain of our partners really want to have a request to book functionality. They don't want to have the automatic booking, even with all the filters that we put in place, they want requests to book and eventually we acquiesced, we listened to them, we said, okay, you're right, we're wrong. We rolled that out um, and that's also helping us with uh, securing extra inventory. So four kind of good concrete examples of where we've really responded to what we heard from the marketplace to make us more competitive and that's helped us as we kind of lent into that sector. We're still focused upon principally the more professionally managed partners where we can basically with one partnership get multiple properties, um, but we're also kind of moving to the lower end of that segment as well, the, the smaller professional companies or partners that maybe only handle a handful of partners. Again, uh, our, our platform is quite attractive for them too. Got it. When you think about aligning a competitive differentiation and platform strength that you guys have as a company against the opportunity and alternative accommodations, how should we be thinking about what you can bring as a platform to that individual category yourself? Yeah, I mean, we bring many things. So as you mentioned, we're a very global platform. Yeah. So um, partners like the fact they can work with us and they can source uh, customers they could never get themselves, particularly if they're you know, a regional uh, player in the alternative space. Um, but then they also like the fact that they're plugged into something where their customers can, can get more than just the accommodation. They can get the flight, they can get uh, insurance, they can get rental cars, they can get attractions. So they kind of tie themselves into an ecosystem where their product also becomes better because it's part of something that is a more scope for them as partners. Understood. Um, when you think about, you, you talked about some of the product changes that are uh, lowering friction and unlocking um, availability of supply. I think that's, that's really interesting to think about those changes. How also do you think about broader investments in the alternative accommodation space to drive supply growth? Um, how high a priority is that for you? How should we think about the investments that still need to be made to continue to scale that business? Yeah, so we have teams focused upon that. We have large partner services teams in, in all of our geographies and increasingly um, as the alternative segment grows, more, that, more those teams get focused upon those opportunities. Um, so I'd say we have a fair amount of investment in that space right now. Uh, we augment that with, with campaigns and programs to encourage people to come on the platform and try it because just like our customers, we always say the best way to get a customer to stay with you is actually to, to stay with you is, is to get them to experience the platform in the first place. Well, the same applies for partners as well. So I'd say um, we, and, and you can see that from our supply acquisition growth. So I think we have a fair amount of investment in, in, that, space, in, in that space right now. Um, and uh, nothing huge in terms of incremental, more, re, more of, of a reallocation um, into the places where we're putting more focus. Okay. Um, you guys have talked a lot about building the connected trip as one of your initiatives over the medium to long term. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you guys see the product roadmap evolving and some of the investments you need, that you've made already and some of the ones that are still ahead of you to, to sort of realize the promise of connected trip broadly as a platform? Yeah, so let's step back a little bit because it's important to understand what problem we're trying to solve here, Eric. So we believe the connected trip is something that can solve what today is still a very complicated, fragmented, and frustrating, frustrating way to book travel. So while a site like ours can maybe handle a piece of the trip for you and do it very, very well, you're still left at your own mercy to go off and put the rest of it together, pay for it in multiple places. If anything goes wrong, heaven help you. you know, you're, you're dying for dollars trying to fix the problem yourself. And we believe that um, the connected trip, which is enabled by technology, can solve more of that problem for you. Of course, as you mentioned, it's a long-term vision, but we 
believe that uh, planning, booking, and experiencing travel to be more personal and more enjoyable um, is a great way to provide value for our customers and, and our partners. And the nice thing about this is it's something that you'll see in incremental improvements and enhancements over time. It's not as if one day you wake up and you switch it on the trip. It gets built out over time. We're building out our verticals, whether it be flights, attractions, rental cars, et cetera, putting underneath a payment platform, um, tying it all together, doing more personalization. So you mentioned kind of where the investments are or, or where the unlocks are. And I would point you to a, a few things. So um, building out those non-accommodation verticals is important because you want to have a connected trip where you can experience it in all the places around the world, not right. just you know, in some core markets in Europe. Um, I talk about connecting those uh, more seamlessly uh, through the booking experience and also being able to personalize the, the, uh, uh, the whole experience. So when you search for something, we don't give you a listing of a thousand general hotels, but we're giving you the five that may be most suitable for the type of, of uh, search that you're looking for based upon the family, the vacation, where it is you want to go, et cetera. Um, so I do think the air will become an important piece of it. That's our newest uh, extra vertical that's growing quickly. Um, and we really want to make sure that that is available to more customers in more places. Um, so that can be part of the overall trip. So maybe just one quick follow-up there. How should we be thinking about the investments that have already been made in air versus investments that still might be ahead or thought of it another way, how, how much higher could air become as a percentage of the mix longer term when you think about connect, if connected trip as a concept is played out to its end conclusion, how to think about some of the mix dynamic? I mean, Airwars is growing rapidly. We're talking about booking.com. Airwars is growing rapidly. It's still a relatively small piece of the overall business um, and has the potential to become um, much, much larger. Uh, you know, we're pleased with how quickly we are growing the business, but we've only been uh, doing air and booking for two to three years, um, scaling very rapidly now in many, many countries around the world, uh, but can be multiple times the size it is right now, uh, just fulfilling the potential within the existing customer base, and we can grow beyond that. Got it. Okay. Sticking um, with air for a minute, there's press reports out there that the European Commission is going to look to potentially block your acquisition of e travely um, any updates on that acquisition, your broader approach to it, and, and what the, the Commission might be planning on doing? Yeah, so we've not heard anything formal from the EC, um, but we've read the same speculation in the press that I'm sure a lot of you have read. So I just make three points. First, we remain very committed to flights, and we've extended our partnership with eTravel through at least the end of 2028. So we, 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 we'll be working with them and continue to kind of build out the flight offering at Booking.com over several years. Um, secondly, if that speculation is confirmed, we would strongly disagree with that decision. Uh, we believe it would be fundamentally flawed on both factual and legal grounds. And third, if that is the decision from the EC, we would intend to appeal it to the European Court. Got it. Okay. So that's, that's pretty clear uh, in terms of a pathway going forward. Um, pivoting away from air, um, Generative AI is a topic that, that you and Glenn have talked a fair bit about on the last couple of earnings calls. It's obviously a topic that's pretty front of mind for, for all technology investors right now. How do you think big picture about the technology impacting the travel industry specifically? And then for booking, how should we be thinking about AI as a mechanism for being consumer facing versus elements of internal in the organization as a way to drive potential efficiencies? Yeah, I think that AI can affect all those. So first of all, it's important to realize that we've been building AI into our products for at least a decade. And we have you know, many engineering teams around the world uh, working on these technologies. So generative AI is a step forward, but AI itself is not something that we've been really based to build, based a business on for a long period of time. Um, there are all sorts of applications for Gen AI and AI in total. Um, I think when it comes to customer facing, um, we can really help personalization. Um, we can make the product experience better. We've already started experimenting. We have the AI booking assistant at booking.com, and we have uh, a product called Penny, which is another chat uh, AI-powered uh, tool at Priceline. And we've got customers using those, interacting with them, um, converting into bookings from them. So it's not just, it's not just kind of kicking the tires. They're actually using these to help them with their booking experience. Uh, early days, but we we're getting data from those to understand where we could take that technology further. Um, internally, I think AI helps, has all sorts of opportunities for the business. I think the biggest areas 
uh, we've been looking at is uh, developer productivity, mm. um, but also back office functions as well, uh, finance, G&A, customer service are all areas where that technology can be applied over time. Um, and then the other thing we've been talking about and people have been looking at is how does it impact the paid side of the business? So what's the opportunity in search? Because obviously a number of our search partners are also investing in Gen AI, and I'm sure over time um, the search experience will change because they want to monetize search. Yep. We're a big customer of theirs. Yep. They'll look to um, make search more attractive. We'll look to get people like us to spend more money with them to, to buy search. Um, so I think we've uh, done very well as a business over time, adapting to changes in search and how we can basically take advantage of those in many cases. So I think it's going to impact many parts of the business. So I think uh, much more opportunity than uh, concern for our business. Understood. Okay. And still wait and see on a lot of the, the early data tests and, and some of the things that you've yeah, uh, put out to the market. Yeah. yeah. Understood. Um, maybe we could pivot to talking about direct bookings and, and building loyalty with the customer base. So. Each quarter, you've sort of talked more about getting mobile first bookings, direct bookings. You built the loyalty program inside the company now, and we've, we've come up on at least the one year anniversary and beyond of that loyalty program. What are some of the key learnings as you've tried to build more direct traffic and a more loyal user base into your platform uh, over the last 12, 18 months? Yeah, so I think first thing is that um, being customer centric is really what drives loyalty. So. People can be loyal if they like the product and if, it, and if it solves problems for them. So you can add programs and things on top of that, but fundamentally, if your product isn't good, you're not solving a customer problem, you're not gonna get much loyalty. So that's not lost upon us, and we think about that every single day. That's why people are loyal to, to a brand, and that's, that's what, 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 what we're building here. And as we, boom, we build out more towards the connected trip, um, that's what's gonna help us build our direct mix. So. Um, Loyalty comes in various shapes and forms. Obviously, our most frequent customers, the ones that use us more often, um, are more loyal, and they're also more direct. So we talk about averages in this business a lot, right? We talk about our direct mix being on average above 50. We talk about the app usage being on average at 48 points of use. But the more loyal customers, the ones who use us more frequently, are running uh, much higher than those numbers. Yeah. So a lot of what we're trying to do in, in, in this business, and really has been from the get-go, is to expand the base of customers, think of it as a pyramid, expand the size of the pyramid, the base of customers, through bringing new customers in, and then move them up the loyalty curve. So as they become more loyal, they, they use you more frequently, um, you get a higher share of wallet from them, you get a higher direct mix. And that's what a lot of the business uh, that we are focused upon is really aiming to, to do. And you just go back to the strategy and talk about the connected trip. Well, that's something we're really aiming at our more loyal customers who want to really get value from their relationship. It's unlikely that somebody who comes on our site for the first time ever is going to buy a full connected trip. Right. But they might. But it's much more likely that somebody who's used us two or three times or understands what we can do wants us to do more and will lean into something like that to solve a bigger piece of their problem. Got it. When you think about the genius loyalty program that you have launched, um, any learnings you can share in terms of what that has meant for uh, behavior on the platform, uh, consumer traffic, uh, and how do you think about identifying or using data to move people into the loyalty program over time and target them? I like the way you think about it there with, with the idea of a pyramid and moving people up the pyramid. How do you think about continuing to sort of move the customer funnel in that direction over the long term? Yeah, so Eric, so you mentioned the genius is only been around for maybe a year or two. It's actually been around for a long time. We just didn't market it. So it's perhaps the world's least marketed loyalty program until <laughs> most recently, but we're changing that. Um, so we did a couple of things with Genius to make it uh, more applicable to more customers. So uh, back in 2021, we expanded the Genius program such that it previously you had to have booked and stayed twice to become a Genius yeah. member. And we expanded it to anybody who has a logged on account. So you don't have to make a booking. As long as you're a logged on customer, you now start to get the Genius benefits, which includes discounts, upgrades, et cetera. Uh, and then we also, at the other end, uh, last year in 2022, expanded, created a new category called Genius Level 3, which is for people who've booked and stayed more than 15 times in two years. Yep. And that's a pretty big cohort. So that's a lot of people doing a lot of bookings. And they get better discounts, better pricing, and they get things like enhanced customer service lines, et cetera. Um, so Genius is, is an important part of the loyalty program, um, and we see it evolving. In fact, we see it evolving in line with the strategy of the business. So at the moment, a lot of the Genius is aimed at the accommodations business, but now we, you, you start to see things like getting Genius discounts on car rentals in a similar way as you do on accommodations. 
And then as, as a program, we've also talked about the fact that over the last few years, we've enhanced our, our spend on, on marketing to also include merchandising. Well, today, a lot of the merchandising spend is aimed at the accommodations business, generally pricing-oriented things. But over time, we want to reorient more of that towards uh, the genus customer base and encouraging them um, to do more things with us. So again, encouraging them to take multiple products at the same time, buy multiple things from us, and morph it as well. So um, the, the genius program is actually one of the fundamental ways that we get people, I say, in the funnel and up the funnel. Yep. Uh, and we have the program kind of aligned with people who are less frequent users, mid-frequent users, and high-frequent users. And uh, that's how the program has evolved. Understood. And, and you teased out something there with thinking about merchandising, but then also marketing spend. And obviously within marketing, there's also elements of brand building. And you guys have done a lot of brand building the last couple of years versus more direct response or performance marketing. How do you think about the evolution of the marketing mix? And what have you learned if you've expanded into more merchandising, expended some effort around building more brand awareness and brand loyalty, and what that might mean for marketing returns or marketing mix in the long term? Sure, so let me try to unpack that. So um, we, one of the things that's led us to the share gains that we talked about as we came through COVID is I think we've been uh, much more um, encouraged or able or willing to kind of lean in to that marketing spend. So traditionally that lean in would have basically been more performance marketing and it has been, but we've been able to spend more on brand. You see a big part of our US uh, activities has been brand. Uh, you wouldn't have seen Booking.com sponsoring the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. For the last couple of years, we've been involved with Super Bowl adverts, uh, Major League Baseball, et cetera. So really kind of upping our game on, on, on the brand side, uh, as well as leaning into our traditional pay channels and then complementing that with this um, merchandising capability we really didn't have pre-COVID to any extent and now is a big part of the equation. So the marketing mix, mix has become richer in terms yeah. of the things that we can use and the levers we can use to try and grow, grow the business. And of course, um, they're complementary. They're not exactly the, the same, but we look at them in one bucket of spend because essentially that's what we're spending upon, upon customer acquisition and customer development. Um, and if you look at what we're spending uh, this year uh, on marketing and merchandising combined, it's, it's still high, it's, it's much higher than it was in 2019, although less than we thought it would be at the start of the year. So we've been able to gain some efficiencies during the year. So last quarter, for example, uh, we were able to spend uh, uh, basically 50 basis points less on marketing than we did a year ago. Uh, that's impressive. Now, it won't happen that way every single quarter, but that's a big improvement. That's from a combination of our direct mix increasing and also and it's also um, looking to now try and re, um, refine some of those ROIs. Now, we've been spending more aggressively in terms of fine-tuning those and bringing them uh, so that the spend envelope is, is a little tighter. Um, so going forward, I think that uh, marketing, marketing spend clearly is one of the biggest spend areas in the business. We've demonstrated, I think, we can use it to grow the business and gain share. And we've also now got more capabilities within marketing to decide how much we spend where. And of course, it's become a much more complicated equation because it used to be just how much do I spend on performance marketing in country A. Now it's a much more nuanced conversation in terms of which of those levers I use in which country, in which geo, in which markets, in alternative versus hotels, in different verticals, and by different customer cohorts. Okay. Um, maybe taking that marketing answer and, and moving it into broader margins, you know, if we, if we reverse a couple of years, the message going into COVID or pre-COVID was flights, connected trip, local, you know, payments. There were a lot of investment initiatives that were aimed towards revenue dollar growth and less about optimizing margins pre-COVID. We've been through COVID. Now you've got elements of the marketing mix you're looking at today. How should investors think about the building blocks of structural margins for the business? I know you're not guiding to anything medium to long term, but just what are the key variables that could be elements of outperforming or, or, or coming in in line on margins if we think about it over the next couple of years? Sure. So first of all, let's step back. Um, I think because 2019 is actually, Eric, a good point to start against. So um, our commitment without getting into a long-term model is to say, look, we believe that coming out of COVID uh, with investments we made in the business, with the new capabilities we have in the business, which are numerous, um, we can grow top line and bottom line faster than we did pre-COVID. Yep. Now, to put that into context and just to take currency out of it to go to constant currency growth rates, that was 8% um, on revenue yep. and 15% on non-GAAP earnings 
per share. So that's, that's the kind of threshold we set ourselves for being higher than, than that post-COVID. Um, now, within that, to, in order to be able to, to do that, there has to be some movement in the EBITDA margins, because you can't generate 50% earnings per share unless you're moving the EBITDA margins in the right direction. Yep. So we have obviously done a good job last couple, couple, couple of years as COVID has moved forward, uh, expanding our margins. We're going to be, be about 200 basis points more this year than we were last year. Um, some of that, obviously, is, is from the timing effect unwinding. Um, but going forward, we believe that we can continue to move margins up modestly from where we are right now. And the two drivers are going to be, back to the where we were prior, uh, our direct mix. Yep. The more that goes up, we can get more market efficiency just from us. And, and starting to uh, get some leverage on the fixed cost, the more fixed cost we've been investing heavily in in the last few, few, few years. Obviously, we've built all, out all these capabilities. They don't come without people. Yep. People is the most expensive part of our fixed cost structure. And uh, we said that next year's growth rate will be significantly lower than it was um, this year, in terms of whether we get, get the leverage or not exactly, we'll update that in February. But directionally, that growth will start slowing down. So um, between the increases to margin from direct mix and marketing efficiency, and then for fixed costs, those are the variables. Now, we're not trying to get back to the 40-ish percent EBITDA margins we were in, in 2019. That would be mathematically impossible with a big payments business we didn't have back then, a big flight business we didn't have back then. But we can still move forward uh, from where we are right now. and very importantly, uh, get above that minimum envelope I talked about in terms of what the growth rates would be. Understood. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left. You guys have made some really big commitments on returning capital to shareholders. Can you just remind us a little bit on free cash flow generation, returning of capital, how you guys think about broader capital allocation within the company? Yeah, so um, before we get into that, just remind everybody the first priority is to invest in, in the business, right, yeah. number, number one. It could be organic, it could be inorganic, it could be both. Um, after investing in the business and making sure we're doing that, then obviously we get to uh, returning excess uh, cash investors over time and uh, through share repurchases as our uh, method for, for, for doing that. Um, to help people understand what that would equate to, uh, think about how we can use the balance sheet as well as the income statement a little bit to, to fund towards that. Uh, we target a, a gross uh, debt leverage ratio of about 2.0, yep. which is where we are right, right, right now. But on a net leverage basis, we've historically run the business with negative net leverage, i.e. positive net cash. Um, and we plan to move that gradually uh, to a positive net leverage position targeting about a 1x over the next few, few years. So there's money, obviously, uh, from the balance sheet to uh, fund repurchases as well. So when you consider our uh, leverage ratio targets, the strong investment grade rating, the outlook for the business, we expect our annual return of capital shareholders over the next few years to be at least our free cash flow. Yeah. And then to turn that into kind of where we are in terms of our authorization right now, uh, we started the year with a $24 billion authorization for repurchases. Um, we now have uh, $19 billion, uh, which we expect to uh, return to shareholders over the next three plus years. Got it. Understood. So in the last minute or two we have, you know, we've talked about a lot of topics of where the company is going product. Uh, initiatives, margins, return of capital, allocating capital into the business. How would you characterize the conversation you and Glenn have about the priorities for the business in the year ahead and aligning that against how you think the broader travel landscape is going to evolve in the year ahead? Sure. So let me break that into two pieces. First of all, um, travel, right, where we think travel is going, going to go. Now, my comment here is not based upon any new market, in, market data points or information, but yeah, when we think about next year, you know, we're hoping that it will be a continuation of what we've seen this year. This year, we've definitely seen consumer preference towards um, services and travel highly within uh, services and experiences. And it's, it's possible that the additional travel opportunities that the post-COVID flexible work policies are going to offer will also continue to fuel demand. If you think about it, very, very few companies have gone back to five days a week in the office, and if you're not in the office five days a week, you have more opportunity potentially to, 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 to travel. And when we look at booking, and we, we actually talked this about a fair amount, whether it's a one-year or three-year or five-year outlook, um, it's really continuing to build on the things we've talked about the last two or three years that come together towards something, and that something is the connected trip. But if you think about it, the progress we've made, payments, the progress we've made in the app, alternative, yep. um, new vehicles, merchandising, AI, U.S., direct mix, these are all things we've moved the needle substantially, and they're all important elements of the connected trip. So whether it's a one-year, a three-year, or a five-year, it's basically the same story. It's just how far down that journey are you? Understood. 
Well, th this was great. Thank you, David. Uh, please join me in thanking David and the whole booking team for being part of the conference this year. Thank you.